Uh, got a question for you this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to James chapter 3. That's where we're going to be. Uh, 1 through 12 are the verses that we're going to hit this morning. But uh, I, 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 I got to be honest with you. Um, I feel very, very, very ill-equipped to preach this message. And so I've written it. I've got it up here for you. But if anybody, I just want to ask a question. Has anybody um, never said, right, something that you regret? Anybody at all ever just not said something you regret? None of you? Shoot. Well, I guess we're all unprepared and ill-equipped. Okay. Right? Because we've all said something we regret, right? Right? Is that right? We've all said something we regret. This morning? In the last 10 minutes? No. Um, okay. All right, right. We've all said something that we regret. What we're dealing with today uh, from the book of James is the tongue. Now, let's back up for just a moment because we're at James chapter 3. So we're working our way through this book. And James's aim, the half-brother of Jesus, his aim throughout this entire book is maturity. Right? Maturity. And we see maturity in chapter 1 in the patience through trouble. Count it joy when you encounter trials of various kinds, for the testing of your faith produces endurance. So be patient as God is perfecting His work in you. We see maturity in chapter 2 when James challenges us all throughout the chapter of chapter 2 between favoritism and partiality and faith without works is dead. We see Him challenging us in practices of truth, personal holiness. And I think that this is why some people struggle with the book of James. We say we, we love it because we want it for the people around us. Come on, is it alright if I preach this morning? <laughs> we want pastor to preach on the book of James because we're just hoping that, he, that God would convict the people around us. But when it comes to our personal maturity, no, don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Because the challenge for maturity. And so today we see James's third characteristic of maturity, power over the tongue. Power over the tongue. The Christians that James is writing to are clearly having some serious problems with their tongue. Crazy, right? I mean, it's unreal. I mean, who would have thought? That, that, we, that, that, that James would have issue, that people would have issues controlling their tongue. James had already warned them to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. James, uh, excuse me, the power of speech is one of the greatest powers that God's given us. I just heard from an AP biology teacher that it is, that the tongue is the most powerful muscle in the body. Between the heart and the tongue, two pretty essential. I mean, the heart's pretty, really essential. You can, anyway, we're not going to explore that any deeper because I'm, I'm talk to Jen if you've got more questions about that. But the power of speech is one of the greatest powers that God has given us because with the tongue, right? With the tongue, we can praise God, we can pray, we can preach the word, we can lead others to Jesus. What a privilege when you think about it this tongue that we have, but with the same tongue, we can tell lies that ruin a person's reputation. We can say things that break a person's heart. And they may not be lies, but they may be assumptions, but the ability to speak words is the ability to influence others and to accomplish tremendous tasks, and yet many of us take this ability for granted. I was sharing with the worship team earlier, actually I was praying and, and, just, and just remembering that one of the biggest things I've been convicted about lately in, 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 in the ways of speech is that, um, is that most of the time the nicest things that we say about someone is at their funeral. You ever notice that? We never tell them to their face. The nicest things that are said about someone are said after they're gone. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. And many of us take this ability to speak words, to influence others, to accomplish tasks for granted. And in order to impress on us the importance of speech, I want us to look at James chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 12, like I mentioned earlier. Not many of you 
starting out, should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Don't miss that, church. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Underline that, star that, I like that. I want you to see that. Even though this is the reality of the tongue, James says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Verse 11, does a spring pour forth From the same opening, both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives and a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Can I pray one more time? Father, I pray that you would speak this morning. That you would take this message, challenge us, convict us, stretch us when it comes to our words. God, we see in this text We are not capable of taming our tongues, but you are. And so I pray that our speech would be given to you this morning. And so take me out of the way. Speak to your church, your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. James is talking about controlled speech. Controlling the tongue, taming the tongue, the great consequences of our words. James, and in order to do so, James gives us six pictures of the tongue the bit, the rudder, the tree, the fountain, and so on. Um, The poisonous animal, uh, 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 the fire. And we can put these six pictures into three meaningful categories that reveal the three powers of the tongue. And that's where we want to spend our time. Number one, power to direct. And in order to talk about the power to direct that the tongue has, James talks about a bit and a rudder. So a bit, many of you, if you've ever been around uh, horses, know what a bit is. It's this metal, it's this piece of metal that's, that's, that's about five, maybe six inches long, maybe, maybe four inches, inches wide, but, you, but it's pretty thick, and you put it right in the back, right behind the teeth, so that when you, and it's attached to two, what they call reins, these leather straps on both sides of the bit that are looped around the hoops of the bit. And what happens is, if you're riding on a horse and you yank on that left um, rein, that left leather strap, that horse is going to turn left. Now, hopefully, (laughs) once it's trained, you do that to a horse that is untamed, that is untrained, that is not broken, then that horse may not turn left, that horse may go up. Right? And then you've got to be ready to go up or you go bye bye. <laughs> Make sense? You pull on the right rein, again, a horse that is trained and broken, and that horse goes right. Case in point, this large animal, this powerful animal, this big animal is controlled by a little piece of metal stuck in the back of the mouth. Same with a rudder. Now, uh, you see this giant ship. 
giant ship. I mean, we can't even see the scope of the ship, but this, is, this looks like one of those freight um, uh, uh, ships that, that takes cargo uh, across the ocean, and, and you see the rudder. Now, this whole entire ship, this whole thing is controlled and steered by this little piece of metal shaped and carved to cut water and to shift and turn the entire boat by this small rudder. That thing gets broken, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. It's sharp, too. You don't want to find yourself near that because it will cut you. It will cut you. The tongue is compared to by James as a bit and a rudder. Apparently, everyone in the assembly, let's back up for just a moment because let's deal with verse 1 here of James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What a warning uh, for folks today. Apparently, everyone in the assembly at this time wanted to teach and be a spiritual leader. For James had to warn them about this. Maybe they were impressed by the authority or the, the sense of prestige or, you know, they like to hear their own voice. They like the microphone. They like to be up front and forgot about the tremendous responsibility and accountability that comes with teaching. Because he reminds us that those who teach the word face stricter judgment. Teachers must um, use their tongue to share God's truth. We can't use this time as a group therapy session. It's easy to commit sins of the tongue. Furthermore, teachers must practice what they teach. Otherwise, they're teaching hypocrisy. They're teaching hypocrisy. I was reminded this morning of, of a time when I was 17 years old in Atlanta, Georgia, at a, at a youth worship conference, coming across a guy sitting in the back of a convertible saying, I could never give my life to Jesus. And when I asked him why, he said, because Christians, especially teachers in the church, are the biggest hypocrites that I know. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, turn and walk out the door and deny him by the lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable, is what he quoted to me. And as I, as I sit and stand and preach to you Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, the thing that I want you to know and that I have to remember is that each one of these messages has to be preached to me first before I can get up and share with you anything. Because if I'm not ready to put this into practice, how dare I teach it to you? I believe that's why many pastors avoid certain topics, but I'm not going to get into that or judge them because I should show no favoritism and love people. So I love my brothers. But this is hard and not something to be taken lightly or without calling. It's not as fun and cool as it looks. There is a weight that comes with teaching and preaching. When I was 16 years old and called to ministry and got home and thought my parents would be so excited that I was called to ministry, to my surprise, my mom tries to talk me out of it. Why are you talking me out of it? I'm called to it. I think she's embraced it now. I'm not sure. You can ask her after church. <clears throat> think of the damage that can be done by a teacher who's not prepared or whose life is not up to par. We see it day after day, don't we, with falling pastors left and right. We all, stumbles in, we all stumble in many ways. The person who is able to discipline their tongue gives evidence that they can control their whole body. It proves maturity if you're able to control your tongue to tame your tongue. So James moves on here. Was James making a mistake here by connecting sins of the tongue with sins committed by the whole body? No. Why? Because words most often lead to deeds. Loose lips wreck lives. Do they not? A person makes an unguarded statement and suddenly finds themselves involved in a fight. Their tongue has forced the rest of the body to defend itself. And not only, not only them, but the people around them. The people around them. 
I was in Boston one time with my daughter Micah who saw a Duke sweatshirt on this, on this, on this mother's uh, person. And, and we were standing in line and Micah, we were actually on a bus, and, and Micah says, that sweatshirt makes me want to punch her in the face. The lady heard her and turned and looked at me to wonder, I'm sure, what I was going to do about this. We're from North Carolina, so the North Carolina Duke thing runs pretty deep in, in, in our home. And we, we have chosen God's favorite color, color Carolina blue. Okay, and, and the, other co- the other blue is royal blue, um, not God's favorite color. Okay, they're named the Blue Devils for a reason. Okay. And, 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 and so then we go into where we were retrieving our car because we were off the shuttle bus and, and Micah wasn't around me anymore. And, and, and I had to own to this lady that uh, I apologize for my, at that time, like eight-year-old. She knows not what she does. <laughs> she knows not what she does. And, and, and this lady was from England. She was checking out colleges for her son. And, and it was raining on the day that they were touring Duke University's campus. And she found the cheapest sweatshirt she could find. And I said, well, there's a reason it's on clearance. <laughs> it was okay. I got in the car to leave Boston. And I turned and looked at Kristen. And I said, one day Micah is going to get me in a fight that I'm not going to be able to win. And so not only do we do this of ourselves, that we speak things that then our whole bodies have to defend, but then our families are involved. Our spouses, are they going to back us? Are they going to support us? Are they going to hold our arms up? Right? Our churches, our church families, our church bodies. And so we sometimes can say things to not only put ourselves at risk, but put the people that we love around us at risk risk. The words have a power to direct and they lead to deeds. And so no, James is not wrong. He's not overstating by connecting sins of the tongue with sins committed by the whole body because we commit ourselves, our persons, our whole bodies when we commit our words. And selecting a bit and a rudder, in selecting a bit and a rudder, James presents two items that are small in and of themselves, yet exercise great power just like the tongue. Like we've already talked about, small bit enables the rider to control a great horse. A small rudder enables the pilot to steer the huge ship. The tongue is a small member in the body, yet it has the power to accomplish great things. It has the power to accomplish great things. The bit and the rudder have the power to direct, which means they have effect over the lives of others. Never underestimate the guidance you give by the words you speak or by the words you don't speak. Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. Shouldn't have been there. John chapter 4 But he goes through Samaria so he could speak to this woman at the well so that he could encounter her. And her life, the lives of others, the lives of her whole town, experienced a miraculous change. Peter, Peter, uh, Acts chapter 2, preached uh, at Pentecost. 3,000 people came to Jesus. Never underestimate the power to direct with speech, with words. So the tongue has the power to direct. Secondly, the tongue has the power to destroy. Look at verses 5 through 8. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James might as well have called the tongue a spider. Wouldn't we have all gotten that? Just nasty, (laughs) reckless, scary evil. Some of us get that. Our words can start fires, can't they? Our words can start fires. True, untrue, assumption, reality. Our words can start fires. In some churches, there are folks who just can't control their tongues, aren't there? 
Some of you are here. Some of you have experienced this, um, where, 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 where you have been in a church, in a body of Christ, where, where, where it should be the last place that we expect this, but we've experienced people that just can't control their tongues, and it results in destruction. Fire not only starts small and grows and creates heat, but it also destroys one of my favorite things to do in the spring, like one of the biggest signs of spring in the bush house is to set the Christmas tree on fire. Love it. Oh man, it's fun. The crackling, the, 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 the immediate, woof, right? We, we've got a fire, fireman in here, so I should be careful with what I say. We have a safe fire pit and we, have, we, we got a hose after the fire was started just so we'd be prepared in advance <laughs> for anything that might happen. And this year we had two Christmas trees and a wreath. And so it was time for some fun. And, and, uh, and, and so I had about 10 minutes. Like it was like July 4th, right? Just, you, you, you know, you, anyway. Uh, but just, right? And, and then all of a sudden, as I'm, as I'm watching our fire, just in amazement, you know, and excitement, right? Just, just like, just so giddy. Um, and and I, was, I was watching, all of a sudden I realized, oh man, the grass is on fire. <laughs> That's spreading. Probably not a good thing. That's when I got the hose and hooked it up and took care of it. Steve, it's fine. This is like weeks ago and our house is still standing. Anyway, um, but, but, but you get that, right? That, 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 that if a fire isn't controlled, it can spread. That's a big problem. It also amazes me. We had a fire last night, and, 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 and it was starting a little slow. I was kind of hopeful that it was going to take, right? Because the kids wanted s'mores and, and, and all these different things, right? And I was hoping, I was hoping it was going to take. But, you know, and I thought, I thought, I thought, fellas, because I got this, Okay. I thought I had built a pretty decent fire, you know, got the newspaper, some kindling, then put the logs and did the whole teepee thing. And I thought, you know, I'm like, I think this is going to take. But, you know, you always, especially when there's other people around, right, there's a pride thing there. Not saying it's heavenly or sinless, but there's a pride thing there, right, that you're like, yeah, this thing needs to take the first go, you know, got to impress, Right? And so, and so it started. I thought it was going to take, thought it was going to take. And I even, I, I think I even made a comment like, yeah, that's good. It's going to take. Turned around, turned back around, whew, got a whole fire. It was awesome. And that's when you're like, yeah, mm, right? Got that. But it's amazing how quick it can, it can go. In the same way, words do the same thing. It's amazing how quick a rumor can destroy a person. It's amazing how quick something that you didn't even mean to say grows and spreads and causes bitterness in a marriage, in a relationship with a son, daughter, brother, sister, mom, dad, to where then you feel and you believe it is unrepairable. That's why James compares the tongue to a fire because fire burns and hurts and our words can burn and hurt. One of the sorrows that Jesus had to bear when he was here on earth was the way that his enemies talked about him. Some of the things, he's out working miracles and some of the things that his enemies are accusing him of, calling him, the names that they were calling him, even on the cross they're spitting and mocking him. It's like, okay, you've won here. You're done here. He's on the cross. Can you not just cut it out? Fire spreads, and the more you fuel it, the faster and farther it will spread. James suggests that all of life is connected like a wheel, and therefore we cannot keep things from spreading. Your life can be injured or destroyed by the tongue. Not only is the tongue like a fire, but it's also like a dangerous animal. It's restless and cannot be ruled and seeks out its prey and then pounces and kills. Some animals are poisonous. And some of our tongues spread poison. The deceptive thing about poison is that it works secretly and slowly, doesn't it? And then it kills. As a pastor, 
I've seen poisonous tongues do damage, great damage to individuals, to families, to entire churches. Let me ask you a question. In this assembly, in this room, in this gathering that we're having right now, would you turn hungry lions or angry snakes loose in a service like this, in a room like this? If you say yes, then we need to talk about your involvement at Summit Church. (laughs) That is an obvious question, and the obvious answer is no. Right? The obvious answer is no. But unruly tongues can accomplish the same thing. They can accomplish the same thing. And some of you sitting here today, it has. Some of you sitting here today, it has. I'm working through a very fun process right now with somebody. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a process that, um, that I was asked to do to walk through, talk through the 10 most painful moments of my life. So fun. And uh, it's taken about two months to get through the top five. And then on, on Monday, as I, was, as I was entering back in, we dealt with six, seven, eight, and nine. Two months to deal with the first five, and then one hour to deal with the next four. You know why? Because they were all the same in nature. All things that people have said to me in the last 12 years that wake me up, that keep me up, that if I relax my face, still hurt to this day. They marked me. And that's not fun. Didn't I say earlier that you're not supposed to use the pulpit for group therapy? (laughs) I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to say none of us in this room are exempt from being hurt and wounded by words. But yet, but yet then we're still supposed to come and sit in this place and love and be loved by a group of people that we have trust issues with because of things that have been said to us or of us or about us. And we know it. Words have the power to destroy and do great damage. James reminds us that animals can't be tamed. And for that matter, fire can be tamed. When you tame an animal, you get a worker instead of a destroyer. When you, when you control a fire, you generate power and heat. The thing about our tongues is that they can only be tamed by God. We're not strong enough. More about that in just a minute. Let's get to number three. The tongue has the power to delight. Delight. I like that word. I struggled with number three the most, but I realized I had D's for one and two, so I had to get a D for number three, so delight. Delight. Some of you appreciate that. The power to delight. The power to delight. The power to direct, the power to destroy, and the power to delight. The fountain and the tree. Look at verses 9 through 12 with me one more time. With it, our tongue, we bless the Lord our Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. The The fountain provides the cool water that we need to stay alive, doesn't it? Proverbs 18.4, the words of one mouth's, uh, one's mouth are as deep as waters and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Proverbs 10.11, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Proverbs 13.14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. These verses in Proverbs parallel what James has written and underscore the importance of our words. 
They underscore the importance of the things that we say. Water is life-giving. Water is life-giving. And our words can give life. Now, however, if water is not controlled, it brings death and destruction. We've all seen floods. We've all seen hurricanes. In Pennsylvania, there was a flood in 1889 that took 2,200 lives and destroyed $10 million in property. Now, back then, 1889, that would have been an immense amount more of property than today. Proverbs 18.21 also says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So not only does water give life, provides life, the cool water that we need to stay alive, not only does it destruct if untamed, but water also cleanses, doesn't it? Our words to others can help cleanse and build people up. Lastly, the tongue is delightful because it's like a tree. It's like a tree. The most important thing about a tree, we could talk about the shade, we could talk about the fruit, we could talk about, but the most important thing about a tree when it comes down to a tree is the root system. That's why James, I believe, compares the tongue to a tree here lastly because if the roots don't go down deep, the the tree will not grow in a healthy manner. And the truth is, if we are rooted in the things of God, then our words will be the fruit of our fellowship with Him. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. James issues a warning at the end of his text here. A fountain cannot give forth two kinds of water. And a tree cannot bear two kinds of fruit. If the tongue is inconsistent, there is something wrong with the heart. So, let's apply this. We all agree on the truths, right? James compares the tongue to six things, three categories, destroy, delight, direct, Uh, these three categories. So my question for you this morning, how are you using your tongue? How are you using the tongue? Because the problem is not the tongue, it's the heart. The problem is not the tongue, it's the heart. You know, mm, the problem is not the tongue, it's the heart. It's easy to have bitterness and strife in our hearts, but those things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and defile us. Matthew says that. As we fill our hearts with God's word, as we yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will be refreshing fountains and trees that give life, that bring delight to people around us. And not only people around us, but to us. And there's three areas I want you to look at when it comes to your tongue, when it comes to the words, when it comes to your heart. Number one, how are you using your words toward God? Another way to put it, How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? 